Thank you for joining the worship services of Shoto, Brady, and Dutton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Julie King, and I'm so grateful for digital technology that allows you to join us from wherever you are in the world. You can join us every week by clicking the links on our Facebook at facebook.com slash Shoto UMC or on our website at umshoto.net. If you like what we are doing and would like to financially support us in ministry, you can find more contact information on our website. And again, that's umshoto.net. We're so grateful that you are joining us. Thank you for the nice music. Our readings this morning come from Luke and Matthew. Luke, Luke 10, verses 10 through 37. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit in eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will leave. Live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay whatever you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. From Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. This morning I would like to um, talk a bit about kindness. It seems like we always get caught up in this way of life, this unkind way of life. Divisions in our community, divisions in our church, political divisions, talking about people who are not in the room, Seems like we always get angry at a lot of things. Driving down a two-lane road when somebody's driving too slow and the traffic is just heavy enough where you can't get around them safely. A clerk 
at a store who's not paying attention and doesn't seem to be happy at all about her job or perhaps makes a mistake on your account. If anyone gives you a cup of cold water, he's my disciple, and he will certainly not lose his reward. It's a great verse from Scripture. There's a little kid's prayer that goes like this. Oh God, make all the bad people good and make all the good people nice. We have a lot of people around us who are nice. But I think perhaps we need to learn to do a little bit better with the kindness part. And what does kindness mean? Useful, being good, being helpful, sometimes tender, sometimes friendly, sometimes generous. Reminds me of the story about George Morrison. He was a great Scottish preacher of some note. But George Morrison dreamed one night that he had died and traveled to heaven. And there at the pearly gate was St. Peter waiting for him. But Peter could not find his name in the book of life and wouldn't let him in. Morrison tried to tell him and explain to him that he was a pastor and a man of God. Peter never heard of him. Morrison protested that he had spent years in a well-known large church and had brought many souls to Christ. Still, Peter couldn't find his name. Finally, Peter said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a notation here in the, in the margin. I have a notation here, and it points back to your name. It says that one night you sat up all night long with somebody who was dying. For all of his great fame, all of his accomplishment, Morrison would be known in heaven only for his deeds of kindness. Back in 1941, war was still going in a little town called North Platte, Nebraska. 1941. No real connection to anything else in the West, nowhere really, had no big manufacturing plants at all. But the train went through there. It was troop trains carrying troops to the West Coast or East Coast or to some sort of uh, center where they could be trained. 20 trains a day. And two ladies thought, what can we do? What can we do? How can we help? And they began to offer just coffee, cookies, maybe sandwiches, a handshake or a hug for the ones that got off the train. That grew to almost 25 counties around North Platte. And over five years, six million soldiers went through that place. It didn't all get off. And it wasn't just for Nebraska boys to get off the train. But the word got back to the soldiers. You've got to get off at North Platte. Only 10 minutes, but you've got to get off. These people didn't know where, soldiers did not know where they were going. It was wartime. They didn't know if they'd ever get back home alive or back to their own home. They didn't know anybody else on the train, but they got to get off. No conditions at all. No distinction about your race or your rank. Get off the train on North Platte and get it loved on a little bit. They checked with some of these great soldiers in the greatest generation, and they said, you know, talk to some of them. I remember that. I remember getting off the train at North Platte, Nebraska. 
The Lord is looking for people like that. A cup of cold water in my name. Kind, gentle people. Kindness is a reflection of the image of God in which we are created. From time to time, we hear about heroic rescues, about animals saving people. Dogs have been known to pull children out of danger. Dolphins have been known to rescue a swimmer in trouble. Within this past month, you maybe saw in the paper where a dog went out and rescued a drowning fawn deer. It happens, but primarily kindness is within the domain of humans. One of the greatest graduation speeches Lyle and I have ever heard was at Tater's graduation from medical school. The speaker got up and said, gentlemen and ladies, you've had a great accomplishment. You're a smart bunch. You will go out and save lives. People will thank you. People will adore you. They'll put you up on a pedestal. But he said, be really careful. Be really careful that you do not get full of yourself with all this adoration. And be kind to your nurses. Be kind to the people who are doing custodial work in the hospital. Be kind. Do not forget. And when you're examining a patient, perhaps, close the door. Pull a curtain around. Save these people's dignity. Be kind. Much is made about how unkind we can be as humans. Sometimes it's even worse than with animals. But the good is more prevalent. We've all read stories about hitchhikers who've gone across America for whatever reason. One, except, except no money, he'd only pick up rides or food, maybe a place to sleep. Two elderly ladies stopped him on the road one day and offered him a ride. The first thing he did was give them a little lecture about why did you stop to pick up me? This is really dangerous. But they said, you know, they admitted that their guilt of going by him had overwhelmed their fear of that event. We do forget there are kind people everywhere. And it's a reflection of that God-shaped image that is within us. But the Bible teaches us also that the concept of kindness does not come easy. Not at all. And they've run experiments where they've dressed up somebody that looks like a bum, a transient, ragged clothes, unshaven, tough shape. And they put him even next to a church in a busy uh, um, city on the street there and see what would happen. Somebody who was really obviously down on their luck. Many people would just pass him by with a second thought, never even seemed to care or to ask about his situation. In the scripture lesson today that Tootie read, it's a good Samaritan story. Stories like the preacher, it's like to preach on because it's kind of a feel good story. But most of us do not focus on the man that's beat up and bloody and lying in the ditch. Mostly it's just about the kindness and mercy of the Samaritan. We think we'd like to we would probably behave like the Samaritan. We think we'd behave like that. But would we? Would we? Say you've got to go to Kalispell for some appointment. 
you get to Browning and East Glacier and it's wind comes up and the weather changes and the wind and the rain and snow is coming in sideways. And there along the road is a Native American with a flat tire. What do we do? It's probably been a long time since any of us here have ever even changed a flat tire. We don't even know how to get the jack out of the car. What do we do? What do we do? A Sunday school teacher has a bunch of little kids in their Sunday school class one day, and he was talking about the Good Samaritan story, about the person who got beat up and was in the ditch, and there was blood, and there was gore, and there was crying, and he really painted a vivid, vivid picture about all the details of how that guy was in the ditch and just got rolled. And after he explained all this gore, he then talked to the little kids in the class and said, if you found a person in a ditch like that, bleeding and wounded, what would you do? And a thoughtful little girl raised her hand and said, I would throw up. I would throw up. Well, probably a really honest answer. Christians, we are commanded to be kind. There's no wiggle room here at all. We have no choice about it. We're told to love our enemies, regard sick people, hungry people, homeless people, lonely people, people in prison, people who are dying. Treat these people as Christ himself. Years ago, I was a drug salesman for a drug company, and I had to call on the prison down at Deer Lodge. Once a month, I had to go in there, talk to the pharmacists and nurses, whatever. People, thank God we got prisons, because there are some really bad people in prison, way out of my comfort zone, way out of it. But here's the admonition people in prison, we are to be kind. We are to offer a cup of cold water to anyone who is thirsty as Christ himself. But that may be easy for people over there. Easy to think what we would do. But what about unkindness in our own house? Over there, we get kind of philosophical. But what about our own home? Not so much. There are a lot of in-law stories. I don't have any in-law stories. Lila's mother died when she was a young girl, never met her. So I don't have any in-law horror stories at all. But I've got some stories about my other three brothers as we grew up in that household the arguing and the fighting. And maybe, maybe this law, maybe this rule applies in that situation as well. But here's the miracle part. If we are kind, it has its rewards. Sometimes when we respond to somebody with love and generosity of spirit, they may become a little kinder and gentler. Years ago, I was at the church here, I got audited by the IRS. People do not know how to handle ministers and income tax. We are considered to be self-employed. Makes no sense at all. A board, a church, sets our salary and our benefits. How then can we be self-employed? Now, if you're self-employed, you pay a higher rate of Social Security, 14, 15 percent in that area. If you work for a company that sets your salary, it's down around 6 to 8 percent. That's quite a bit of difference. And so I get all my receipts and I get all my stuff and I'm worried and tense. I'm going to go down to the IRS and face the music and see what happens. And so I'm ready to argue and whatever. Very nice lady, 
looked up all my stuff, gave me the benefit of the doubt. But I think if I would have gone in there fighting mad and doing whatever, I think maybe, maybe she would not have given me a different sense of what I, what I would owe. I think the story that Roger Kelly, our highway patrolman here in town, now retired, tells the story. And if you've ever been pulled over for whatever reason, this is no time to get uppity and smart alecky at all when that highway patrolman is right there at your window. And Roger Kelly tells the story. What's the thing that just got his goat more than anything? And he was not in tendency to give anybody a break. Is when they rolled that window down and that person in the car, drunk or whatever else says to the, to the highway patrolman, what's your problem? He says, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. That's what happened to him. The greatest acts of kindness sometimes occur when there's no chance of any reward. And these are the acts that Christ commands us to do. That's the way Christ lived. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean up our lives. He didn't wait till we could reciprocate. He gave expecting nothing in return except one thing, and that we will pass this kindness ahead to others. That's our Christian call. How did this kindness of God appear? The best picture God ever had taken was Jesus Christ. God saw the whole brokenness and despair of our world. He saw all of us who perhaps have no hope of ever breaking free or changing things. And so he sent his son to the rescue. There's no logical reason for him to do that. No one deserves his kindness because often it's ourselves that brought our suffering to us. But thankfully, God does not treat us as we deserve. Well, then why does God show kindness to the undeserving? Why does he show kindness to the undeserving? Because the undeserving are the only type of person there is. Undeserving is the only type of person there is. But, the big but, but it has a limited time offer. We don't talk much about it, but there's a judgment day coming when the opportunity to find God's kindness runs out. It runs out. What do we do? Buried deep within us is that peace, that God-shaped peace within all of us. And we find out that when we begin to act kindness and show kindness towards other people, other situations, that then they are more likely to act kindly themselves. When they see somebody set the example, it makes a difference. And that's our job. And so be ready to show kindness because it will come back into your life, I kid you not. And the good things that are happening to you right now, you can think of them. The good things that are happening to you right now, perhaps, maybe, be the result of kindness that you saw observed in your parents and are now passed on to you. People, this is our job. This is our job. 
to invite this power of God into our life. To show mercy, we will get mercy. To show kindness, we will get kindness. To show people what God is like, maybe, we will begin to see God everywhere in our world. Kindness draws people. Kindness is an attractant to anybody who sees it and experiences it. And so this is our assignment, if I could give one out to all of us this week. Not only this week, but for the rest of our life. Be kind. Intentionally, intentionally go out of your way to be kind, even this week. Amen.